be in Matthew chapter 26. As you're turning there, I just want to remind you that the, uh, the church is not a service, it's not an organization, it's not a building, it is a faith family. And so God, communicating with his faith family, tells us that there are two things that we should do regularly. Uh, one is have communion, the Lord's Supper. We talked about that two weeks ago and how important it is for the, the faith family to gather together and have a family meal. And so on April 2nd, we will have our next communion service. It is part of our Easter musical, and I would encourage you all to be a, uh, a part of that. And also, as David mentioned earlier, we are going to have uh, two services on Easter, and uh, we believe that, uh, one is, well, it doesn't matter what we believe, God says that in the Ten Commandments that we should honor the Lord's Day and we should keep it holy. The word holy means set apart. And so we should have a day of our week where we set apart everything else and we just focus on worship and rest. And so on Easter, we realize that a lot of people travel because it is connected to spring break. And so we just want to give you an opportunity to obey God and to be in his house, especially on the the greatest celebration on the Christian calendar, uh, Easter Sunday. And so now you'll have two opportunities to do that. We do have nursery and children's church available at both services, 9 and 11 o'clock. So make sure that you uh, plan to be here with... um, with us for one of those services, if you are physically able. Uh, so uh, I, people ask me all the time, they're like, why do you like Taco Bell? You know, we got 74 Mexican restaurants in Elizabeth City, and I still eat at Taco Bell. And I, the only answer I can give you is nostalgia. I don't know. Uh, I like Taco Bell, but I don't even like the new ones. I like the old ones with like the boarded up windows and the bullet holes and stuff. Um, that's, that's my favorite kind of Taco Bell. And so I learned a couple lessons at Taco Bell recently. Um, Lesson number one happened when uh, my son and I were going to Taco Bell. We're in the drive-thru, and uh, the people in front of us order their food, and then they get their food through the window. And then they kind of pull off to the side real quick over into the parking space, and then this woman gets out, and she starts screaming at the guy in the, pass- in, the, in the driver's seat. And so he gets out of his side, and they're like yelling at each other over top of the car. And I'm trying to find my phone because I really wanted to get the video of this. Um, but then the woman reaches inside the car and pulls out her burritos and just starts throwing them at the guy over top of the hood of the car. So lesson number one, I learned burritos are weapons. If you find yourself in a dangerous situation, grab a Taco Bell burrito and chuck it at the assailant. They will leave you alone because I saw this man running for his life. Um, the other thing that happened to me is uh, y'all love me a lot, and uh, you gave me a bunch of gift cards for Pastor Appreciation, 10-year anniversary, Christmas, and when I was sick. So I had a stack of gift cards uh, to Taco Bell about this big, which is enough to buy a Taco Bell, by the way. Um, but anyway, I've been using those every Sunday after church. I go by myself to Taco Bell, and uh, it's always the same lady that's working the drive through window, and so every Sunday, I keep handing her these gift cards, and uh, you can tell she's starting to, like, pick up on a trend, because sometimes, like, there's not enough left on the first card, so she's like, you still owe us three dollars, so I reach in, I grab another card, and I hand it through the window, so this last time, she went, she disappeared, and she came back with what I can assume is a manager, because they were wearing their hat straight, um, and so, <laughs> they're, so they're kind of looking at me, like, do you have something to say to his son? And I'm like, look, I know what you're thinking. No, in my basement, I do not have a gift card making machine, all right? I told him, I said, look, my church loves me, and so they give me lots of Taco Bell gift cards. And she looked at me, she said, you sure about that, hon? <laughs> so lesson number two, you may not love me, you may be trying to kill me. And I had no idea what was going on. So anyway, look, the, the whole goal of this series, they're like, how's he going to connect Taco Bell to Jesus? Um, the, the whole goal of this series is to connect you to the love of Christ in a way that will deepen your love for him. So it's by seeing his love for you that you fall in love with him. And so what I really want to do is I just want to give you a bunch of gift cards. I want to give you a bunch of Jesus gift cards. So when you're having one of those Tuesday mornings where the kids are crazy or you look in the mirror and you're like, I'm too fat, I'm too ugly, I'm not smart enough, or you're getting ready to take a really hard test and you're like, I don't know if I can do this. I just want to give you enough of God's gift cards where you can just start cashing those things in, where you can just say, look, Jesus, I I can't do this on my own, but I've seen the love that you have for me enough love to sacrifice yourself for me. When you're talking to God, you're like, God, I've seen the love you have for me, enough love to sacrifice your only son for me. And you just keep cashing in those cards day after day, receiving the blessings of Jesus. And friends, there is no better way to understand the love of Christ for you than to study Matthew 26 through Matthew 28. 
It's called the, the Passion Narrative. It's St. Matthew's Passion. It's a beautiful, beautiful retelling of the true story of Jesus, starting with his meal, the Lord's Supper, and ending with his resurrection. So we are going to uh, focus on that. And again, I want to just give a shout out to Tim Keller and the work that he did on this uh, 23 years ago with his church. Uh, it's really informed a lot of what we're going to do um, throughout our series. God, we ask you this morning that you would just help us to see your word fresh and new. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Matthew 26, 47. It says, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, suddenly arrived. A large mob with swords and clubs was with him from the chief priests and the elders of the people. His betrayer had given them a sign. The one that I kiss, he's the one. Arrest him. So immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus looks at him and says, Friend, why have you come? Then they came up, took hold of Jesus, and arrested him. At that moment, one of those that was with Jesus, and we find out later that was Peter uh, in other Gospels. So Peter reached out his hand and drew his sword, and he struck the high priest's servant's ear and cut it off. Then Jesus told him, Put your sword back in its place, because all those who take up the sword will die by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot call on the Father, and he will provide for me now more than twelve legions of angels? How then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say this must happen this way? Other gospels tell us then that Jesus reached and picked up the severed ear and put it back onto the, the priest's head. Verse 55, at that time Jesus said to the crowds, have you come with swords and clubs as if I were a criminal to capture me? Every day I used to sit teaching in your temple and you didn't arrest me. But all this happened so that the writings of the prophets would be fulfilled. That's the Old Testament. Then all the disciples deserted him and they ran away. So as we read through this sermon and then next week when we talk more about his, his trials and his crucifixion, I want you to notice that a lot of the gory details that you know about the cross uh, are not in the Bible. These are things that we've learned uh, from sources outside of the Bible. Now, we do learn about the mechanics of what happened, but the, the scriptures do not go into vivid detail about the, the crown of thorns and what it did to the head of Christ or the whipping and what it did to the body of Christ. We, we've picked all that, that gross, gory imagery up from other sources. And you say, well, why is that important? Well, Tim Keller said, it's almost as if the gospel writers are saying, that you don't need to have your heart wrung by the fact that Jesus was suffering. You need to understand the meaning of it. So, for example, watching the Passion of the Christ gives you an idea of what happened, but its focus is more on the gory details of the physical brutality that Jesus went through and not necessarily on the actual meaning of why he went to the cross. Keller continues, it's not so important to be moved by the fact that he died on the cross. You need to understand the theology of the cross, understand what it accomplished. So what I love about Matthew is that he records the words that are spoken by Jesus to help us understand the whole point of the cross. These words help us understand the cross in a way that transcends this, this emotional uh, reaction, this visceral reaction that we have to the beatings and the crucifixion of Jesus. It, it moves us beyond our emotions to the actual theology behind what he did, uh, why he did what he did. So for the early Christians, we talked about how the cross represented shame, represented uh, hostility and suffering and judgment and weakness. And that's everybody in the Roman Empire, that's how they saw the cross. But after Jesus went to the cross, the Christians looked at the cross and they saw value and peace and healing and forgiveness, and strength. So how did that happen? Well, I can tell you this. It did not happen simply because they saw Jesus on the cross. What, what happened in their lives transcends what they saw, because there were a lot of people that saw Jesus lifted up on the cross, and it did not affect their lives at all. The reason it touched the Christians emotionally, or beyond their emotions, was the fact that they understood why Jesus was actually going to the cross. They understood why all of this was happening. So look at this, Luke chapter 23, verse 27. It says, A large crowd of people were following Jesus, including women who were mourning and lamenting him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and your children. 
See, it's the lesson that Jesus is teaching us here. He's looking at these women who are uh, emotionally broken over the fact that they're seeing this man so, so brutally beaten and carrying this cross up a hill. They're moved emotionally, but they're not connecting to what he's doing spiritually. So he's saying, look, don't cry for me. Cry for yourselves. It's just a, a kind way of saying, you need to repent. You and your children, you need to understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. Don't just be moved by the fact that I'm this beaten and bloody man carrying a cross. Be moved by the fact that you are sinners in need of a Savior, and that is exactly what you're getting in this moment. This cross that I'm carrying, this is about love and forgiveness. You need to connect to it in a theological way, not just an emotional way. Matthew, thankfully, embeds this teaching of Jesus into the crucifixion narrative so that we can clearly understand why Jesus is doing what he's doing. So you'll see this uh, breakdown of what I just read. You have a betrayal by Judas, by Judas then you have the, the words of Jesus explaining why it happened. Then you have Peter and his, his uh, aggressiveness pulling out his sword and cutting off the ear. Then you have statement, a statement by Jesus saying, this is why that happened. Then you have an angry crowd and then a statement by Jesus. And each one of these three elements teaches us a little bit about why Jesus had to die on the cross for us. So the first thing we learn is that the cross produces devotion. That's Matthew 26, verse 47 through 50. We have a, we have a kind of a dissertation on Judas. Uh, Judas is a, a complicated character in Scripture, and opinions on Judas, they vary from one extreme to the other. If you would pick up Dante's Inferno and read that fictional story, uh, when he talks about Judas, he says that Judas is all the way down at the very bottom of hell, which for him was a, a frozen lake. And the reason Judas is down there is because he is the worst of the worst. But then if you watch more modern stuff like Jesus Christ Superstar, you'll see Judas portrayed as this complex, almost sympathetical character. So the question is, what is Judas? Is, he's the, is he the worst of the worst, or is he some sympathetical character? Well, the Gospels paint kind of a, a picture of Judas right in the middle. So let's talk about this kiss. He, he goes up to Jesus, and he, he kisses his rabbi. Uh, I was trying to figure out like what that was all about because I figured it was more than just uh, identifying Jesus as the one that needed to be arrested. There had to be more to it, right? And this is what I found in the Anchor Bible. Moses Auberbach, who's a Jewish scholar, says, Disciples were never permitted to greet their teacher first because it implied equality with the teacher. Did you see what Judas did? He came up to Jesus and he greeted Jesus first. He, he says in that kiss and in that statement, he says, I've always resented your authority. I've always resented the fact that you told us that you had authority over us. Now look at me. I'm Judas and I'm looking eye to eye with you. I'm no longer your student, but I am the teacher. So is Judas sympathetic? Not really. <laughs> he's, kind of a, he's kind of a bad dude. But before we judge him too much, we need to make sure that we realize that we're all kind of like Judas a little bit. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 26, verse 20. We talked about this two weeks ago when we were talking about the Lord's Supper. It says, When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. Deeply distressed, each one began to say to him, What? Surely not I, Lord. Now that's not a declarative statement, because there's not a period there. It's a question there, question mark. So that means that there's a translation there that might make a little more sense if we kind of word it differently. What they're saying is, Is it me, Lord? See, even the disciples realized that there was a part of them in their heart that could reject Jesus, that could be the one that betrayed Jesus. Surely not I, Lord, which means it could maybe be me. I could be the one. I could be the Judas. Everyone, beginning with Adam and Eve, has felt the desire to be their own God. And Judas is basically selling his investment in Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, which really isn't much different than what a lot of us have done with Jesus over the years. Uh, investments 
Uh, I made an investment when I was a child in 1989 when I purchased every King Griffey Jr. upper deck rookie card that I could get my hands on. And my friends would tell me that I needed to sell those cards when they were like $20 a pop. And I'm like, I'm not selling these cards. These things are going to put me through college one day. Guess how much they're worth now? Not as much as the paper they were printed on, all right? It's no, it was a terrible investment, and I should have cashed out. Back in the early 2000s, I had a wonderful DVD collection. And my friends were like, look, everything's moving digital. It's, you got to get, get rid of your DVDs now while they're still worth something. And I'm like, ha, 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 no, I'm not going to do that. This Indiana Jones THX box set is going to buy me a Porsche one day, so I'm going to keep it right here on my shelf. Guess how much it's worth now? Nothing. <laughs> the thrift stores will not even take your donations of DVDs a lot of times, all right? I should have cashed out my investment because my investment was going south. That's how Jesus was seen by Judas, except Judas wasn't like me. <laughs> Judas was like, hey, this is going south, and I need to cash out right now. I need to trade in my stock of Jesus for something that's worth more. Jesus was just a means for him to obtain money and, and power and fame. He, he heard the statements of Jesus saying, the, the new kingdom will come, and I'll be the, the leader of this new kingdom, and you all be my family, and you know, uh, it'll be heaven on earth. And so he bought into all that. But then he began to see that, that that wasn't what was going to happen, that Jesus was actually headed to a cross. And so he decided to cash out. His stock was no longer turning a profit, and so he got rid of it. We have this story in Job chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, where Satan is talking to God, and he says, Have you considered my servant, or God says to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? No one else on earth is like him, a man of perfect integrity who fears God and turns away from evil. But Satan answered the Lord and says, Does Job fear God for nothing? Like, the word fear means awe and respect. So does Job have awe and respect of God for nothing? Or is he actually getting something out of this relationship? See, Job was extremely wealthy, and he was very blessed because of his obedience to God. And so Satan is saying, look, you take away all of the good stuff that goes with that relationship. You take away his money and his career and his power and his fame and his family. You take away all that stuff, and he will sell his stock in you. And so God is like, all right, you have access to Job. Do what you want to do. And what we learn in that story is that Satan was wrong about Job. Job stood the course, and he stayed true to God even when he lost all of that stuff. But Satan may have been wrong about Job, but he's not wrong about a lot of us. See, when life doesn't go the way we expect it to go, a lot of times we become a seller. We sell off our Jesus stock, and we replace it with something we think is more valuable, usually something the world has to offer. Sometimes it's silver and gold. Sometimes it's fame and fortune and recognition. Sometimes it's just leisure activities. But we think that these things are going to be better for us and our family than our relationship with Jesus. And so we cash in our stock and we invest in something other than Jesus. So what is Jesus' response to that? He looks at him in verse 50 of Matthew 26, and he says, friend, why have you come? Now understand, he's not calling Judas his friend. This word, if you study it in the original language, is a patient warning. It's like, friend, back up. Friend, move away. You know, he's got, It's got this little bit of an aggressive tone to it, like, why are you here? Jesus knows why he's here. He's just kind of calling him out on why he's doing what he's doing. And I just think back to the story of Mary, not his mom, but Mary and Martha, and that story where Mary goes into this dinner party where Jesus is at, and she takes this bottle of perfume that was worth one year's salary, and she pours it over the, the head and the, the feet of Jesus. Do you remember who was most angry? Remember who was most upset in that moment when she's dumping out this year's worth of money onto the, the head and the feet of Jesus? It was Judas. Judas was mad. He's like, that money could have been used for ministry, <laughs> right? He gets upset because where's his mind? His mind is thinking about all the things that they could have bought, all the stuff that the world has to offer that was more important than Jesus. Whereas Mary understood the most important thing in the world is not the money, it's not the perfume, it's none of that stuff. It's Jesus. It's devotion to Jesus. The cross proves that 
Jesus' commitment to you is fully complete. He never sells his stock in you. He's never like, I'll love them as long as they, and then fill in the blank. It's just simply this, I love them. Unconditional love is what Jesus showed you. He's not like Judas. He would never trade you for anything else. He says, I love them. And you're like, how do I know? He went to the cross. He gave up his life for you. Tim Keller says, how do you come to grips with someone who has given themselves utterly for you without you giving yourselves utterly to them? And you might say, well, that's unreasonable. Being devoted to God, do you really expect me to come and worship at church on a regular basis and to give tithes and offerings and to be involved in ministry and put others' needs ahead of my own and pray and read the Bible and do all these things that go along with being a Christian? That seems completely unreasonable, doesn't it? Well, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, in view of the cross, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Or as the King James says, this is your reasonable act of service. This is your reasonable act of worship. So in view of the cross, is it reasonable for us to expect you to be devoted to Jesus? The answer is yes. It's reasonable. It's the right reaction to the cross. Number two, the cross flip-flops reality. In verse 51 and 52 of Matthew 26, we see Peter pulling out a, a sword. At that time, a sword was a symbol of justice and, and judgment and force. So pre- Peter grabs that sword and he's like, let's go, Jesus. It's time. Let's start, the, let's start the war right now. Let's set up your kingdom on earth. Isn't that what this is all about? And Jesus is like, no, put away the sword. Now, please don't get lost in the debate whether this is an argument for pacifism or not. It is not. It is not an argument for pacifism. This is not what the teaching is about. And so don't get lost in that debate. Focus on the meaning of the cross. What we have here is Peter thinking in a worldly way. He's thinking with his human mind. And we have Jesus challenging the way he thinks, inverting his mind, flip-flopping his reality. And he starts by telling him there's a a flip-flopped view of salvation that you don't really understand. See, Jesus gets what we deserve, and we get what he deserves. That's flip-flopped. That makes no sense. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, he made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us. Let me read that again, in case you missed it. He made the one, that's Jesus, who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Peter is saying, Lord, I'm with you. Let's judge these guys. They're bad. We're good. Let's judge them with the sword. And Jesus is like, no, that's not what this is all about. Keller again, he says, Jesus came not to bring judgment, but to bear judgment. Jesus came not to bring the sword, but to take the sword. You say, what, what's this sword thing all about? Well, if you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had sinned, and they had been cast out of the garden. And this is what happens in Genesis 3.24. It says, God drove the man out and stationed a cherubim, and the flaming, whirling sword east of the Garden of Eden, to guard the way to the tree of life. Do you see what's going on here? The only way back to paradise, the only way back to God, the only way to the tree of eternal life is by going through the cherubim who is wielding the flaming sword. So the only way for us to get to God, apart from Jesus, is to go through the sword. And Jesus knew we could never do that. So what did Jesus do? He took the sword for us. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have the boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus. How do you get to God? It's through the blood of Jesus. Not our blood, but his blood that was spilled for us. Salvation is not something you fight for. 
It's not something you purchase. It's not doing more good things than bad things. It's not getting your name on a church roll somewhere. Salvation is something that you receive from Jesus who took the sword for you. That's a flip-flopped view of salvation. It's a lesson that Peter needed to learn. Think about it this way. The, the mindset of Peter, the way to become weak according, or to become strong according to Scripture is to first become weak. The way to become confident is to admit you're afraid. The way to know you're valuable is to admit that you are a sinner. Have you ever thought about how flip-flop that is? See, Peter's brain is in the world, and Jesus' brain is like, no, it's different. <laughs> it's flip-flopped. It's inverted. You need to think differently. Put away the sword. See, again, Peter was pulling out the sword, and he's saying, look, these are the bad guys. Not you guys, by the way. You're good guys. <laughs> Out there somewhere. These are the bad guys, and we need to judge the bad guys. They're what's wrong with the world. They're the ones that are messing everything up. So let's pull out our sword and let's judge them. And Jesus is like, no, Peter, actually, you are the one that's messing everything up. You are the one who's seeing things wrong. You are the one that's being judgmental. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned, Peter and this mob. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So put up your sword and extend grace. Put up your sword and extend the gospel, not judgment. It's flip-flop to what the world says. The world says, pretend we're the good ones and everyone else is the bad ones. That's not how you're going to see a change in your community. It's not how you're going to see a change in your country. It's not how you're going to see the change in your personal life. The way we see change is to admit that we're weak, to admit that we're afraid, and to admit that we are sinners, and that we need Jesus to step in in all three of those accounts. And if we do that, then he gives us confidence and strength and value. He takes away that judgmental mindset that we used to have, and he replaces it with a mind that is focused on extending grace to other sinners, just like we once were. And it also flip-flops your, your values. When Peter pulls out the sword, he is suggesting that the change is going to come from political and military power. Live by the sword, die by the sword. What that means is that the sword is not going to produce the change that we all seek in our own lives and in the world that we live in. Let me ask you this. What military did Jesus run? What political position did he hold? How much money did Jesus have? None, right? None. He didn't have an army. He didn't have a political position. And he didn't have any money. A lot of times, he didn't even have anywhere to lay his head at night. But who changed the world more than Jesus? Nobody. So what's the lesson here? The lesson is that we do not have to have power. We don't have to have a military. We don't have to have money. We don't have to have a political position in order to change the world. Check this out. This is how this works. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, became poor for your sake, so that by his poverty you might become rich. So what our Savior Jesus does for us, what he's doing for Peter in this story, and what he's doing for us every day, is he's reminding us that if we live selflessly and represent Christ in the way that we interact with the world around us, the world will become a better place. So now the good news is we have Christians running militaries. We have Christians in political office. We have Christians with power and influence and they are serving the world with the selfless heart of Jesus Christ and making a little bit of heaven here on earth. But the other good news is, if you're not one of those people, you can still make the world a better place, and you don't have to have any of that stuff. Jesus didn't have it. The only thing he ever did was put others' needs ahead of his own. And if that's all you do with all your life, then you will make the world around you a better place, regardless of how much money or what your job is. The cross turns the world's value system upside down. So Peter needed to put away his sword because he had the world's mindset. He was valuing the things that the world values, money, power, fame, all those. 
And what Jesus is telling him is, look, if you want what's best for your family, if you want what's best for you, if you want what's best for your community, put the sword away. Stop thinking like a human and start thinking like a Christian. The way to power is submitting to the cross. Now, finally, the, the cross produces confidence. Now, I love this part. The cross produces confidence. We learn that in verse 55 and 56 of Matthew 26. Jesus is spitting truth to the mob, and I love it. He's like, you are wrong. <laughs> I'm not a criminal. These people have clubs and swords and all kinds of stuff to like hurt him with. And he's by himself because everybody else ran off. He's by himself, and he's facing the mob, and he's like, you are wrong. Not only are you wrong, you are also cowards. He said, I set every day teaching in your temple, and you didn't come and arrest me in the middle of the day. You didn't come out in daylight and take me, did you? No, you waited till the middle of the night. Why? Because you're cowards. But then he shows them grace. He says, look, this has to happen anyway. This is all part of the plan. See, Jesus' friends, his disciples, his followers, they saw the cross and they're like, this cannot be part of the plan. Even though Jesus told them lots of times, this is part of the plan, they're like, this can't be part of the plan. So when they see the cross in Jesus' future, they all run away because they think God has lost control. But the cross doesn't mean that God's lost control. It really means that he's gained control. It means that God has won. The cross is part of the plan. God is working. So don't get spooked by the swords and the clubs and the angry mob. View your life through the lens of the cross and you will understand that God is never out of control, that he is always in control. He wins. There's a story in uh, the Old Testament about Elijah and Dothan. Uh, he's getting ready to fight a battle and he's super outnumbered. It's just really him and his servant. And his servant is freaking out because there's an army that's coming to kill them. Rightfully so. Elijah's calm, cool, and collected. Why is Elijah calm, cool, and collected? Because he can see what's going on, but the servant cannot. And so Elijah wants the servant to be able to see what is happening. And so he prays and says, God, can you allow his eyes to be open to what is actually happening around us? And in that moment, the servant's eyes are open, and he looks around, and he sees the legions of angels that Jesus was referring to. He sees the legions of angels that are fighting the battle for them, and he gains that confidence. See, that happened in Dothan, but something else happened in Dothan. Anybody remember? Any Bible scholars? A long time before that, there was a man named Joseph, and his brothers got jealous of him, and what'd they do? Where did that happen? Dothan. <laughs> yeah, it happened in Dothan. So Joseph was thrown into the pit in Dothan, and in that moment, he's like, well, all is lost. I'm in a pit. My brothers hate me. And then in Dothan, he's sold into slavery. So you have these two situations that both happen in the same place. In one with Elijah, it is clearly evident that God is at work in that situation. You can see the legions of angels fighting the battle for you. In this other situation, you have things that appear to be hopeless as if God has lost control because Joseph cannot see what's going on. But the end of both of those stories, Elijah wins the battle, but also Joseph, he, he's able to advance to be the second most powerful man in the world. And by advancing to that position, he saves thousands of people from starvation, including his own family that threw him in the pit in the first place. Was God out of control in Elijah's story? No. But he also was not out of control in Joseph's story. So here's the point. Some of us we're going through a season like Elijah, where we can clearly see that God is fighting the battle for us. But there are also people, probably in this room and watching online, that are in a situation like Joseph, where it seems like God has lost control. So if you're over here in your own personal version of Dothan, what do you do? Here's what you do. You look at the cross. You focus on the cross, because the cross is the reminder once and for all that God is always in control. If he's in control in a situation where his own son unjustly is dying on a cross for us, then he is also in control of whatever situation that you find yourself in. So no matter what comes into my life, no matter what cross I have to bear, 
I need to look on the other side of that cross and see that there is always a resurrection for me. And how do I know? It's all because of the cross. Father, it's my prayer this morning that through this walk through the garden, seeing how Jesus handled himself as he was arrested, that we would be inspired, Lord, to face our own personal struggles in a a new way, to view salvation in a new way, to see the, the values that the world has in a new way. Lord, flip-flop our mind. Help us to stop thinking like Peter and the disciples and start thinking like Christ followers. Help us to see the world the way you allowed Elijah's servant to view your activity. Help us, Lord, to open our eyes and be able to see the ways that you are active on a daily basis in our lives. And Lord, help us to remember this by just reminding us daily to look at the cross. Paul says, take up your cross daily. What he means by that is focus on the cross every single day because it's at the cross that we find our confidence. It's at the cross that we find the ability to resist the temptation of Satan to trade in our Jesus for something that the world has to offer. It's at the cross that we meet Christ and his incredible love for us. So Lord, I want to pray for those that may be in their own personal dothan this morning. They can't see how you're going to make any good come out of this situation. I pray that you would, in their lives, Lord, fill them with your spirit. Give them the confidence that they need to be able to face the the angry mobs, the clubs and the swords and all the things that the world tries to beat us down with. Help them to face that with confidence, knowing that you are in control and that you won. Our victory happened 2,000 years ago on the cross of Christ. So help us to claim and live out that victory on a daily basis. Lord, for others, Lord, that they're still living in a worldly mindset like Peter, where they're depending on power and money and position for security. Lord, I pray that they would put up their sword. They would stop fighting their own battle and allow you to fight for them. Lord, that they would be able to see where salvation comes from. It's not something we fight for. It's something we receive freely from you. And I pray that today, this morning, Lord, that they would just pray a prayer like this in their, in their mind or even out loud. Just say something like, Lord, I, I know I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. And I believe the Savior is Jesus Christ. I believe he died on the cross. And I believe three days later, he rose from the dead. And with that faith and that confession, I give my life to him. Forgive me and help me to follow you well. And if you prayed that prayer, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit of God comes into you and seals your salvation. So no matter what happens to you, from this day forward, you are a child of God. And on the other side of that cross is your personal resurrection where you will spend eternity with God in a place of paradise. And he also promises that as you live on this earth and face the trials and temptations, that you will have the strength you need to live an abundant life, even against the mob. So thank you, Lord, for what you've done in our midst this morning. And thank you for allowing us to have an opportunity to receive your love and to give it back to you through the songs that we sing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Yeah.
chorus and singing the chorus twice. 